All right, so without wasting time, guys, let's finally jump into our picks for, you know, best and worst, right? So uh, what we're going to do, we're going to kick things off with the uh, Sean Connery. Um, then we're going to talk quickly about um, George Lazenby, then Roger Moore, and then we're going to talk briefly about Timothy Dalton, and then we'll end with Pierce Brosnan, right? So as far as my favorite um, Sean Connery uh, Bond film goes, uh, that has to go to Goldfinger. To me, this is the blueprint. This is the formula. This is how you do a Bond film. This is how you do a Bond spoof. You know what I mean? Like you, everything you need to know about how to how to design and write a Bond film is right here. This is a literal blueprint fit. Uh, I mean, for one thing, like I said before, the team song is just fantastic. It's my all-time favorite. Uh, Shaw Curry just works himself into this role perfectly, right? And, you know, this is the third time he's played Bond here. And here, he just just fits it, right? Yes, he's dropping all these lines like, shocking, and I must be dreaming, and all that kind of stuff. But you remember those moments, right? You remember Pussy Galore. You remember that that reveal of her name and just the reaction of Sean, right? Um, you remember Odd Job, right? You remember, and of course, you remember Ulrich Goldfinger, right? One of the, the greatest villains in, you know, um, Bond, in the Bond franchise. Um, you know, his lines like, no, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die, you know what I mean, and all that kind of stuff. I just love how... Just as a film, just as a uh, as a as a Bond film, how fun it is! It's it's escapist. It's just you kind of rock back in your chair. You know what I mean? You're, you're having some Sunday lunch, and you're just enjoying this film. And that that that's what it was for me. I just like, and I it's just one I could just watch over and over and over. I mean, yes, it have some stuff that don't really hold up at all, like the invisible gas. Like I mean, come to mind, like invisible yeah. gas, invisible gas. I mean. It's, Oh, and, and that whole plot with 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 uh, with with Fort, with Fort Knox. I mean, yeah. it, it, it sounds it sounds it sounds it's logical, eh? but <laughs> I mean, but it still it still works for me, though, and it still remains one of my all time favorite Bond films, right? I don't have like a top top at the moment because I like to you know basically classify them in terms of actor, but for me, this one is my top, right? As far as my least favorite, though, or I should say worst. Matter of fact, I'll call it least favorite, right? Because I don't hate this film. I would say just for all these films in general, even Die Another Day, I don't hate these films. I don't think that they are unwatchable. It's just some just don't hold up as well as others. Some you just have to really gear yourself up uh, for to watch, right? But all of them you can just kind of watch and, you know, appreciate them for what they, what they are, right? But for me, though, as far as the worst goes, or worst quote-to-quote, boy, unfortunately, I had to give it to Diamonds Are Forever, boy. Um, this, this was where... And, you know, it's the circumstances around it too, right? Because uh, we're going to get to George Lazenby in a bit, right? Uh, because of the failure of um, On Her Majesty's Secret Service in the box office, uh, the producers basically begged Sean to come back, you know what I mean, for, for Diamonds Are Forever. And, I mean, yes, he is born, and, you know, I mean, the team song is fantastic, but, but the story just did nothing for me. It was just this whole convoluted thing about oh, we're going to pretend that Bond is dead and all that kind of stuff. And you're thinking, oh, they're going to be, you know, because one thing I love about the Bond films is, you know, these, you know, these locales. They keep going into exotic locations. They just go to Las, to, to, to Las Vegas and just stay there. And as far as, oh, you want to see some beautiful locales? How about the Nevada Desert? And let's see, let's see Bond in a, in a moon buggy driving it. Isn't that fun? No, not really. It's just bland and boring. Really. It, it just looked like your average, you know, early 70s action film, unfortunately, which is the last thing I want to say about a Bond film, right? So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not one that I, I flat out hate. It's not a show that I can't watch if I feel like it. But, yeah, as, as far as, you know, as, as Bond, as far as the Sean Connery films, yeah, this was a kind of disappointment for me. So, uh, Alice, um, best and worst Sean Connery. Um, actually, don't come at me for this one, uh, but um, my favorite Sean Connery is Diamonds Are Forever. I'm sorry. What? <laughs> Tell me why yeah. this one. <laughs> I, um, I don't know if it is that it's my favorite one because I remember that was the first Bond film that I actually saw in my entire life. So I don't know if I love it out of nostalgia or what, but uh, I also like the bond girl as well too jill st john she's one of my top bond girls as well and i just thought that her chemistry with sean connery was so you know kind of off the walls kind of thing and i, I love the little um quirky little element 
of the character of Tiffany Case, even though you know she was a diamond smuggler. You know, I just I don't know. I think it might be more of a nostalgic kind of thing as well mm-hmm. for me, as it's the first Bond film that I ever saw in my entire life. Right, right. Yeah. Um, oh, fun fact I have here for you guys. Though. Well, I don't know if it's a fun fact, but it's a bit of a, a trivia. Um, you remember the actress um, Natalie Wood, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Her, her sister Lana Wood actually acted as the the Bond girl who was in the casino called Plenty or Two. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, which is yeah. one of the most cringe, I remember plenty. One of the most cringy, you know, yeah. Bond girl names like ever, in my opinion. Yes. Yeah. The first time I heard it, I was like, oh. but yeah. So here, here the, here's a freaky coincidence. I just want to let you guys know, right? So Robert Wagner was Natalie Wood's husband, and he was um, right now he's under suspicion of having something to do with Natalie Wood's death, right? Oh, um, true yeah. crime scenario. Right. But here here's the other thing. Um Jill St. John is his wife now. So basically <laughs> his ex sister in law and his future wife were in the same movie. Yes. Yeah, just that. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> yeah, you're pretty. All right. um, well, well what's okay. what's your what's your worst? Means, my worst um is actually you only live twice. I thought I, that I the, could understand. Uh, yeah. yeah, I thought the plot was a bit of a weak source to me. Um, I thought the storyline was all over the place. Even even though I loved the introduction of Donald Pleasance as um, Bluefeld, I always thought that he was the best Bluefeld that, that they had. They had a specter. Mm, yeah, we, we know, we know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah but it's it's my worst um, Sean Connery film because it's just all over the place and... It's too uneven and it is not actually in all of them. That's the one I've watched the least. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and you know, as much as a guilty pleasure for me though, uh, I really can't forgive the the Asian face that that they give Sean. Yeah. Like. Yeah, it was a bit disrespectful. No, no, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, CC, uh, quickly, your uh, pick for best and worst, Sean Connery. Oh, this is hard. Connery is my least favorite era of Bond. Uh, <laughs> like, it's it's so... Okay, but, like... Because, like, okay, for okay for best... Oh, man, I'm, I'm going to be unpopular. But for best, like, the one I find the most enjoyable, and I keep going back and forth on this one for a couple reasons, for obvious reasons. But my very conflicted best is actually You Only Live Twice, and there's a couple reasons for that. I like the... act. Okay. The big selling point for me of the Connery era is is the camp. So like I'm watching Doctor No, I remember, and I remember having this thought of, oh, no one told me that these films were like fun and over the top. Okay, okay. And then like as they go on, they're like, oh, like like very over the top, very like. But unlike Die Another Day, that's trying to like force that back. It's very like genuine and very pulpy and very campy and very. But like in a way that feels genuine and organic. Now, my issues with... The issues, what, what makes the films harder for me to watch is actually not that, but, like, uh, dated uh, gender politics, dated racial politics, and mm, mm. social, political stuff. But for me, You Only Live Twice is the most over-the-top and the most campy of the Connery era. Like, it has... It's the one that's It so, has ninjas. Like <laughs> yeah. it has ninjas. It's the one that I'm in, I am I am pretty sure this movie invented that poisoning someone by lowering a thread into their mouth and then pouring liquid down the thread thing. Like I I yeah. know that does not exist. I, I I won't be surprised, but I uh, I've seen like some ninja flicks, like some samurai ninja flicks adopt that. But I feel that Speed came Reza right after. That. <laughs> oh, did okay, okay. Speed yeah, but I feel that this did happen right after you know um, you only live twice. Yeah. But like it's it's genuinely funny. It's it feels a little tighter than because like one of my I remember I was going over my notes in preparation for this. I was going over my notes from my initial watch through, and I don't even remember from Russia with Love like that. Mo- I'm trying. I have sat trying to remember that film, and I am not like it's not conjuring up any like I don't remember what happened in that film whatsoever. But 
you only live you only live twice is weird it's bold it's it's got much tighter action much tighter plot it feels it has fewer unnecessary scenes there are still plenty of unnecessary scenes and subplots it has the closest to like a female spy who keeps her own with bond of the connery era and that's still not saying a whole lot and the only re- but but i feel like the only reason i ended up not i have not owned it i do not own it like on dvd is because of stereo the japanese stereotypes and the yellow face makeup that they put sean connery in which which every time i'm sitting there like oh man you only live twice was a good time maybe i want that on dvd and then i have this image of sean connery made up to look japanese i'm like you don't know no never mind never mind i can do without that one but <laughs> the favorite of that one is you only live twice least favorite i am gonna have to say diamonds are forever only because mm. like it feel it does feel very weak. It feels very much like because I know that none of the actors, despite their enthusiasm when they first got involved in Bond, I don't think any of the actors involved in Bond were like thrilled by the time they left the franchise. And I'll get into that when I talk about my, my favorite, least favorite Roger Moore. But a lot of the Bond actors were very much done by the time they got to their last films, and Connery definitely feels that way. Like Connery. Connery Connery throughout a lot of Diamonds Are Forever has the energy of Harrison Ford in Rise of Skywalker. Like he's not <laughs> not thrilled to be back, but he's he, he's back anyway and and dropping the the one-liners with much less conviction. But yeah, so I would say favorite you only live twice, but god that's a conflicted favorite. Um and then least favorite Diamonds Are Forever for me. All right, uh, Tracy, uh, best and worst, Sean. All right, okay, I will tell you my absolute worst, Sean. Um, my absolute worst, Sean, is never say never again, which is consider- which is for all intents and purposes, un- un- unofficial, <clears throat> because Eon didn't really, <clears throat> excuse me, Eon didn't really produce it. But no. never say never again. I I I I have this yeah. this memory, this feeling, of getting like really excited about seeing. Oh, okay, Sean, or seeing this for some reason or the other. I don't know if it was showing on said same cable or somewhere it was. And then it became. I realized very quickly this is kind of like a a spoof of a franchise, but at the same point in time, you're using the main character. He's much older. He's trying to do the swag thing where he's still trying to be all suave and, you know, hot for the ladies and all this kind of stuff. It is, if, okay, if if The Rock is the, <laughs> the, the best James Bond is old movie, <laughs> Never Say Never Again, is the worst James Bond is old Sean doing, I don't know what, to just fling cash at him. Because, again, it wasn't a, a, a Cubby Broccoli, Eon, Eon, um, uh, Eon, Eon film, but it still falls in line. And that, for me, falls as the, it's the worst. It, it would have been a lot more um, palatable for me if you had taken Sean and you had said, let's do a Johnny English or some kind of type of something. I'd say let's make fun of the Lol, franchise that and you Johnny just English. left. <laughs> and Johnny English is Johnny English is, is cool. But so for me, just the idea of that um kind of just dampens it for me. Whereas on the flip side, I um so I'm I have two thoughts here in terms of 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 best. I give Dr. No special mention. Because I saw Dr. No, um, I didn't, so when I actually started watching it, and again, I don't really remember how it started. I just know I got into it. Um, but when I saw Dr. No, this was this was after um, I had seen Diamonds Are Forever and all that kind of stuff. And then we saw, oh, the very first film is Dr. No. And I think I have that one on DVD as well. I'm not sure. But... Uh, you know that one didn't have like the wild opening sequences that we that we came to know and love. It was just basically like the silhouettes of 
girls dancing and it was like the gun barrel or whatever it is like that it was it wasn't polished it was a very first if i'm not mistaken it was very first but what i like about it is just and i have it as an honorable mention but i like it in terms of it's sean just being playful with everything on the set it's sean seeing again i can't remember her name right now but she's there at the beach and she and he's like uh, you know she's asking why are you looking for shells and he's like no i'm just looking and it's just so playfully shown but i do <laughs> i do dig um goldfinger i dig goldfinger for um as shown as bond i dig goldfinger for odd job I have. I am a, a guy who, um, of the many attempts uh, I have had of wearing hats, and I say attempts um, because certain hats just don't work with me. I love fedoras, and granted that, of course, our job wears a top hat. But the idea of taking your hat and flinging it, and causing a statue's head to, you know, fall off, I was like, this is love. Um, so I am very much into. Uh, into it because of that, and again, like I said, in terms of the idea of the 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 girl who you know is just covered in in gold, um, it's I think it's one of the reasons why I th when we reach to Pierce, that one movie really annoys me because it really tried to do, and I don't know if it was because it was the 40th anniversary or whatever, but it really tried to do. Doctor No and a couple of other films as that particular movie, but Goldfinger is my is my favorite Sean, um, and my not favorite Sean is Never Say Never Again. I don't know what the hell that was, but it apparently came out, and I had to sit down and watch it, and I was really annoyed. So yeah. Uh, so Ricardo, um, best and worst Sean. Yeah, um, similar to Tracy. Goldfinger, the best, the worst, never seen of it. Again, um, there's a sequence with domination. It is so stupid. <laughs> what? <laughs> it is by far the stupidest thing you'll see in a Bond movie. They, they, they play in this video game and oh, they get electric oh, shots. God. And the two of them, like, this is, this, is, this is all the bad guy, the good guy, you know, with a, uh, with a cheap 70s arcade game. It is <laughs> so stupid. Oh, God. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, well. To be fair, I still haven't seen Never Seen Never Again. I was supposed to watch it in preparation for this, but uh, time. So you're not not hearing don't about this. Don't you're not missing anything. You don't see it. You're not missing anything. Best. It's best, a poor man's best. thunderbolt. That's basically. Yeah, what that's it. pretty much it. Yeah. Um. Mm -hmm. Best one. Best one is yeah. Goldfinger. Goldfinger is the, the one. It's the archetype. It's the the paradigm. It's the one that shape everything. Um. Yeah. A lot of it does hold up, but again, it's it, it as with the entire James Bond franchise, it is a product of its time. Um, but it, uh, it still, a lot of it works and does hold up, to be fair. Um, and it just works, the, the iconic look and feel, you know, gold gold, gold woman dead in bed, um, you know, great villain, you know, you, know, you get a shaken not stirred for the first time, if, if I remember correctly. And yeah, it, it just works. Um, number one, yeah. Best, best Sean is Goldfinger, worst is Never Say Never Again. All right. And, um, you know, as, as we see, did you know, best for last for you with um, Ricardo. Uh, just mentioning briefly uh, Honor Majesty Secret Service, which, you know, you said Ricardo's one of your top five, right? Um, you know what I mean? Just coming right after um, You Only Live Twice, right? Because, yeah. you know, at the time, Connery was just sort of fed up and, you know, it was just a bunch of chicanery behind the scenes um, right. involving him and the producers, right? But yeah, um, I, I took the opportunity to rewatch it, though, and I do understand and respect its place as far as one degree, it's in my opinion. Um, it does suffer from peace. I think the big issue really is the pacing of it. This right. movie is like about two hours and 20 minutes long. There's like a huge chunk in the middle, which I felt was just like padding. Um, but other than that, though, I just love the fact that, you know, it was them, you know, the, the producers kind of going back to the B6 with the the the, the Bond, uh, with the character James Bond. I'm right. um, giving him a lead that he actually falls in love with, that actually wants to, yeah. you know, eventually marry, right? Um, right. And you know we see Blowfield, uh, Blowfield, sorry, played by Telly Savalas. Right, that's a, big, that's a big factor. That's a big factor. Yeah. That's why I like this film yeah, mm -hmm. because of Telly Savalas, big, big yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it really works. He really works in this. And I think if I'm not mistaken, this is the the first time where we have the villain with the physical defect because yes, he didn't have earlobes, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. But really, but I think the third act is fantastic too because that's where they yeah. amp up all the action, and everything like that. Yeah. Um. Just quite excellent, you do. But really, yeah, why, why, why it works so well for me is that it's it's 
a product its time is 1969, but it feels well, six, really, yeah, uh, six, it feels yeah, 69, 69. Yeah, it feels really serious. Like it feels deadly serious. Like it wait, does. Oh, children? Like it yeah. just it's like more like a Lacare story than a than a Bond story. Like yeah. it, it feels more like that, like a John Lacare. And even the way how Lazarby plays Bond is just like. Yeah, it's true. No, this is not a Bond film. This is something else. It feels yeah, totally like, different. You don't, you don't feel you don't feel like any kind of sexy type or anything like that. It's just like straightforward, no nonsense. That's how it felt at least to me. Um, it it I I think a lot of that film works in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. And then well, for me, what really makes it work too is that end though. Um, it's still a gut punch, boy. And when I saw it again, I felt it. I really felt it, boy. Because yeah, like immediately right after he gets married, Spectre comes and murders. Well, you know, um, yeah. does a drive by now, yeah. And his wife gets killed, yeah. And the movie ends like up. that, too. Is, you is know, what mean? yeah, it's, it's, it's South Central, Ellie. Yeah, I mean, she just, yeah, just run up on she, yeah. No, that, yeah. That's, and, that's and that's like, the last line where you know, where, yeah. where the police come with the, the guy and the, the police, the cop, sorry, on the bike shows up, and you know, is she okay? It's like, no, she's sleeping, everything's okay. We have all the time in the world, by which you know, harkens back to the Louis Armstrong song that was you know, yeah. for, for this movie. Yeah, boy, it's just such a gut punch of an end. Though. Actually, yeah. a really bold way to end it. And, and last thing I'll say here, it's clearly an inspiration to, you know, for the conclusion of um of Casino Royale. Like, I have a right. feeling that, yeah, the ending of that movie got, it was inspired yeah, it, heavily it, it, by it the end of this one. It influenced a ton of films. Um, You know, just, just the mere fact they decide to go bold with, it, with that kind of ending. If I remember correctly, it influenced Inception. <laughs> which is like well, yeah, kind of, yeah. kind of interested, but yeah, that makes sense. Mm. However, uh, yeah, yeah, it's easily one of my favorite, not my personal favorite um, Bond film, but like it's up there. Right, right, right. Um, I don't know if you guys have anything else quickly to weigh on on um on on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Not, not particularly. George is George is one of those actors who I I have no no, no memory, no thought where he's concerned. So I'm like. Good on him, but like you know, good on that particular outing. But it wasn't one of those um, that I kind of raved at or anything of the sort. Okay, yeah, I th- I think it's a film I respect more than I like. Like I really like because it feels like, if given the given how the hit the spy genre pre Bond used to be a lot more Hitchcock, and then this is the only feels like it's kind of trying to go back to a more serious, dramatic, like almost Hitchcockian Bond film. Right, yeah. Which I appreciate, even if I find the execution like it's. A, it, I, I mean, you know me. I will always like, especially given my current frustrations with Bond. I, I appreciate anyone who's like, we're going to try and reinvent the franchise in a pretty radical way. So, but I feel like the execution is just very slow in a way that's difficult to keep me like invested and on board with what's right. going. Right. Like, that's understandable. Um, I I don't know. For me, it was at the time, and this is was this was a time when I was a more serious business person when it comes to pacing. To me, it was like no slow pacing means serious and you know introspective. That's how I interpret right. it. But no, it, it's it's just bad pacing. Let's just be. It it is a flaw of the film. I admit that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I said, it's slow pacing. Yeah. I yeah. feel like it would for me. It would probably be like one of the best if like there was like a tighter, leaner cut of it. But like. Right, like if there was right. a tighter, leaner cut of it, it'd probably be one of my favorites. But as it is, I, I kind of I I respect it more than I like it at this point. I think. All right, um, Alice. I don't know if you have anything quickly to say about um, on a Majesty's Secret Service. Um. Yeah. I mean, it's it's easily like could be a, a special mention for me because um and it's also one of the the bonds the bond films that actually stays as close to possible to the actual Ian Fleming novel. Um, in terms of George Lazenby, um, he felt a, a bit awkward in the role. You could see that he was a bit awkward in the role. I mean, he was a model to an actor, so he's not going to have, like, you know, any big sort of special skill set. But he did try very, very hard with the role. Um, it's just, I'm sorry, in terms of his face, he was not the most attractive Bond, because he kind of looked like his face was made up with different parts of other people. I'm sorry. But I just thought right. it, it me he, as a bond, you need to be kind of like not drop dead gorgeous, but have like these chisels kind of features. And physically he just didn't do it for me, but he was super tall though. Um, oh yeah, he was. Yeah. And Diana Rigg is easily one of my favorite Bond girls and Oh yeah, I she she was the, great in this, yeah. Yeah. And she's actually was actually one of my favorite actresses, rest her soul. Um 
the the whole um ending scene i agree with you um i saw it again and i was like oh yeah literally you feel like somebody punching her guts because and she died so horribly too because it was just instantaneous it wasn't like she was able to say goodbye my darling with her with her last breath or anything it was just like bam shot to the head and that was it and he was just so shocked and then that last line is like yeah it was very traumatic i should say but yeah yeah, it it has its place in the 007 history so we should always be sure to mention it agreed agreed right so uh just running through best and worst roger moore um for me my favorite is the spy who loved me right um i mean this was for me where the Roger Moore formula of the of the franchise worked. Um, it embraced camp, but I felt like it was light, uh, light camp in my opinion. Though uh, it's even right down to the inclusion of this this henchman named Jaws. I mean, Jaws, right? <laughs> I mean, this guy with metal teeth, though, and somehow they made it work, though. So like, yes, he was part goofy and whatnot, but he still felt like a threat, right? Um, Roger Moore really filled into his shoes with this one, though. Uh, like I said, the team song was great. The opening sequence, though, with him just skiing off the cliff and just seeing this this one this this shot there of just him falling over, and then he um, lets go of the the lets out the parachute. You see the Union Jack, though is just so mind-blowing it is like i imagine like if i was in you know in cinemas uh back when it came out though i i'd be one if the, one of the many people just stand up and just cheer i mean it's just such a brilliant <laughs> moment um but yeah boy um so, and you know for me it's just it's just the, the the bond elements just tweaked and just improved in all the right ways though and most importantly, though, it just embraces the fact that, yeah, we you know we're having fun. You know, we're not really taking ourselves too seriously. You know what I mean? Um, and, yeah, it, it just it just worked. It just totally worked, right? Now, as far as worst spy, uh, 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 sorry, guys, but I have to make this a tie. Reason being is because I just could not decide which one I, I, I despise. Sorry, I just yeah. didn't care for more, right? So I have the man with the golden gun and a view to a kill up there. Yes, I know they're the two easiest yeah. ones because they're the weakest of the Roger Moore films, right? But for and me, you with don't, the man with the golden like gun, the, um, the, 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 the nipple, the, 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 um, the prosthetic nipple and, and that yeah. kind of stuff. I was now I was going to get that though. Like you have Christopher <laughs> Lee, the iconic Christopher Lee I... as this guy with a third nipple and uh, an island with a laser that's powered by solar energy and um, you know, you have the plane, the plane, you have, you know, home, um, you know, Nick Knack, that character. And it was just all this right, squandered right. opportunity, don't you? Just waste it on, oh, you know what I mean? And in this case, this was where they tried to make Roger Moore look and act like, like Sean Connery, and it just didn't work at all, right. man. You know what I mean? That's, that's, that's the most that's the most gentleman, noticeable. you have him, like, all tough and rugged. It's like, no. Yeah. That's the most noticeable mm-hmm. thing about that film. Like, yeah. like, fuck, like, dude, you're serious, right? Yeah, and you know, like I said before, I I just could not care for the theme song at all. <laughs> Sorry, Ricardo, I just I just didn't. But yeah, boy, this was just squandered opportunity here, boy. And then it was even worse now with um, a view to kill. Now, in 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 retrospect, I mean, you could understand like, okay, well, I mean, Roger Moore was like what fifty eight or whatever when he did this, so okay, like it, he he not gonna be as lean as he was back then. I I get that, boy. But still, concept wise, it it just didn't work for me. I have Paul Christopher Walken just being this evil tech guy who wants to like destroy Silicon Valley for reasons and this is long subplot involving like microchips and horses and steroids and that that even that itself went nowhere for me uh, in my opinion though and it was just like okay we, we trying to fit the 70s bond in the mid 80s and then work um, the, the, we said Paul Grace, Grace Jones in this I felt we could have got more out of it we could have got more out of uh, Christopher Walken um Tanya Roberts, eh, as you know, Bond Gill, eh, I guess. And Roger Moore really, really tried. I'll, I'll give him that. He really tried, though. But if, if I could just pick one good thing about this this movie, though, is the team. Like, I actually think that the, the, the team is, 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 isn't half bad, man. It, it's very, very, very mid 80s. You know what I mean? The Duran Duran song. Um, but it fits, though. And I actually like that dance to the fire. Like, just that section kind of works for me. You know, something about it, right? But yeah, I have those two as, you know, these favorites. Uh, Ricardo, um, best and worst uh, Roger Moore. 
Right. So, yes, I happen to agree. Um, you know, even though I'm super biased towards it, I can't give it the best of the Roger Moore films. So, yes, uh, my favorite Roger Moore film is, as you put it, um, Spy Who Loved Me. Um, nice. Yes, it, yeah, it, it works. It's one of the better. It's very sleek. Um, solid villains. Yeah, best of the Roger Moore ever. The worst is Man of the Golden Gun. Um, colossal waste. Like, it's it, because why it suffers is not it. It's not, it, you know, it's one of those, hey, this is not the objective worst thing, but it's just such a wasted, squandered opportunity. I mean, how you could waste Christopher Lee? Great premise. Thank you. Yeah. Great. It's a great, I think it's a great premise, at least for a okay. Bond film, where, where you have this really silly idea of, oh, this man who's so weird and off, 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 off the cuff. And that's kind of thing. But that's everything. Just, I mean, some of the worst executions you could find um, out there. Well, and by uh, the way, yeah. even his, his death to know, like, that yeah, was just no, so bland. It was just like nothing, all this build up, like, oh, the, the 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 most skilled sharpshooter or assassin. Just one shot that, yeah. Yeah, nothing. Um, yeah. Another film I would want to put on the list, but I, 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 don't, I, I find it, it was just so over the top and didn't work at all. Uh, but they, some people seem to like it, which is uh, Moonraker. I find Moonraker just felt so off. Um, uh, but nah, uh, Golden Gun silly was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Alice, best and worst, uh, Roger Moore. Um, coincidentally, the, the now it's gonna be three of us. that's so gonna say the spy who loved me. Um, nice. Yes, I I totally agree with what you guys said. Um, Roger Moore has found his stride. He made the the character his own. Um, I particularly love Barbara Barker's Anya Amasova, mm, the uh, mm. KGB agents. The two of them yeah, have very good. good, yes, they have very good chemistry during the movie. And I, I even like the little, um, little tension that that's created there because Bond actually kills the love of her life, so they have to work together. But she she hates him because he killed the love of her life, right? So I love that little um, tension in between there, and by the end of it, you know, um, she well, she doesn't kill him, obviously. Um, and yes, the spy who loved me is also one of made it on my um, top Bond themes as well too. Um, I even liked the look of the movie because um, they had some very picturesque places, like the film scenes that they filmed in Italy and Egypt. Yes. Uh, I yes. don't know. Yeah, that scene in Egypt, uh, it was really fantastic. The kind of light show um, that they had. I think it, that was where they first met Jaws. I'm not too sure. Um, yeah. Again, Jaws, um, a very, very memorable Bond villain. Uh, this guy with, with the metal teeth and yeah. mm-hmm. larger than life and, and scary to it. Um, I, I do have to make a special mention, though, in terms of favorite Roger Moore's for your eyes only. I have a very special mm-hmm. place in my heart for that movie because I really um like the uh, the Bond girl from that one, and I also I also like the story. I like the plot a lot. It reminds me of one of those over the top romance novels, revenge kind of of things. So special mention to for your eyes only. Um, my worst Roger Moore. The man with the golden gun. We're in agreement with all of that. Nice. Uh, they tried uh, to make Roger Moore something that he wasn't, and he felt very stiff and, and robotic in in this role. And um, also, we agree, wasted opportunity with somebody like Christopher Lee. For goodness' sake, the man played one of the best Draculas on screen for the Hammer horrors. Yep, yep, yep. You can't take somebody like that. You could have done made him into. A, a more horrific, terrifying villain. But no, just somebody with some weird sexual preferences and yes, supposed to be a shark. Yeah, 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 I remember. And, and oh, the, the big thing, he has a, a third nipple. Is like, really? That's all he could come up with? <laughs> I'd rather he had a third eye, for goodness sake. But yeah, and t- the wasted character of Nick Knack, uh, it was just like a, a big joke. At the end of it, you know, so it really, really fell flat for me. Um, the song, I, I love the singer, love Shirley Bassey, but yeah, it was like she was just relating the the whole movie in in the um, in the lyrics. The lyrics could have been better. All right, so uh, CC, best and worst, Roger Moore. So uh, 
for best, uh, before I get to my actual best, I'm going to make a special, I'm going to make a ca- the case for Moonraker. For me, I like Moonraker. If, if there was another um, Roger Moore film that I could own, it would probably be Moonraker, aside from, I already own my favorite Roger Moore film. But the reason, and the reason is, it's it's not so bad it's good but that's kind of where i would start to put it because like it's so <laughs> off. it's so campy it's such yeah a it, it really oh, like it's, 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 peak, it's, it's peak bon camp in my opinion it's peak bon camp i mean it's like an awesome pause party did it right well it's also it's such a it's yes. also a blatant attempt to to like fit a square peg into a round yes, hole which is right. oh man star yeah. wars and science right. fiction exactly make, yeah that's it. exactly Problem. Right, let's make James Bond Star Wars. And I'm sitting there like, this doesn't work, but watching it not work is so entertaining. Like it's just like <laughs> yeah. right, they're in space and there's a yeah. big space battle at the end with lasers. I'm like, this is funny. This is And I hate what they did with Jaws in that one, but we're giving him like that. Like, I, like that I love interest. Like, that was cool. I actually I like it. I liked this, yeah. It was cute. Dumb. <laughs> was cute. Love Oz. Jaws having this love interest and then the two of them go and live happily ever after is like wonderful. I also love the whole bit where like Jaws turns on the main bad guy because um you know because he's like he's going on about his like race of super people and then he realizes that like in this world Jaws and Jaws's girlfriend do not fit in so Jaws exactly. is like hey, screw you and then like like that's a very fun way to take a henchman for me. But no, my genuine favorite um Roger Moore is for your eyes only. And the reason I, I, and, yeah. the, re- and yeah. the reason yeah. that it is my favorite is because it is the only like I, we've been talking about what like the best old Bond film is and I would actually say one of them up there is for your eyes only because it actually feels like I love the opening that has the whole homages to on her majesty's secret service and like giving a little closure like he's there in his wife's tomb his wife's grave and then like they'd have the whole little thing with Blofeld even though goodness, right, right. how many times has Blofeld died by this point um, <laughs> but, like, know, right. <laughs> but like at this point it's it's like this it's but like I love how that's the whole pre-title sequence because it feels like this little oh okay that is what happened in the past we're putting that all behind us and we're moving forward and so what we end up with is a more slower pace like we have a slower paced film where like more actually gets to feel like he gets to play this kind of older agent and i actually like oh i'm here for this 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 feels this has this kind of easygoing pace to it um it's got great action though like um i'm not no, normally i'm not the kind of person who enjoys mountain climbing sequences but there's actually a couple really great ones in this film um i like that the main relationship between um more and the bond girl is not as like it's romantic but not as like quite out there and sexual as some of the other ones which feels because i know that even more himself at one point i think at this point like complained to the producers that he was like at this i am old enough to be most of these girls father and i'm supposed right, to be doing like, right. romance scenes with them so this feels awkward so um so so for your eyes only feels like this nice like, like where their dynamic is it, there's romance there and it, it does have that feel of like a romance of like kind of a a romance novel or kind of that kind of pulp thing but like it it's less like sleazy sexual than previous bond films and i really it, it, it it's my second favorite bond film period actually um nice. and it and it's actually the best film to end the roger moore era the problem is we made two more and that gets to my to my picks for the worst Roger Moore films because if Roger Moore had ended with For Your Eyes Only, we would I think it would have been like one of the best farewells to a Bond actor. But instead, we make Octopussy, which is a mess. Octopussy is a mess. Like there's not I guilty there's... pleasure of mine. But it, it is a mess. It is a mess. Right? Like for real. Me, me too. Guilty pleasure of mine too. Right. So right. Many, there are so many ideas that film throws at the wall and I don't know what it's doing with them. And there's that weird bit where Louis Jordan just says pussy, pussy over and over again. And I'm like, I don't know where to look. I'm just like making eye contact with the ceiling. Just like I I, I, I can't watch this. Uh, and then um it's so, and then like it gets bonkers, and then it's dull, and then it's bonkers, and then and then, as if that wasn't enough, 
we end with like we end with a view to a kill which is so bad like a view to a kill is i i said at the beginning that one of my problems with bond is that it feels like other action like cinema action cinema and spy films are all moving faster than the James Bond franchise does. And A View to a Kill is the one where that is the clearest for me. Like, that's that's the film that feels the most kind of awkward because it, because it, because it, like, it's a film at war with itself because here are all these ways in which it's a very 80s spy film, like a very 80s, very, like, um, very 80s spy film with, like, all the trademarks of an 80s spy film until it's a bond film and those two elements don't like gel well with each other and now roger moore is back to having to be like full bond romance stuff and it's still like i think that last shower scene is an absolute crime because he's like they're naked in the shower with this young woman who's like i think no that was the moment i think where the quote came from where he like he hated having to do that last scene with the bond girl in the shower because he's like because like I'm old enough to be her father. This is really <laughs> yeah, uh, tiny robots. Yeah, really I, I, I hate the I hate Q's robot that spies on oh them. Like it's done God. for 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 laughs and just like no, that's that's just creepy. So, like stop it, stop it. And there's so many moments throughout the film where like it feels like it, it where the Bond stuff feels creepy, and then the '80s spy stuff is like over the top and excellent, but then not, and then some of it is way too slow. It's it's a film that doesn't quite know what it wants to be, and then it just kind of pitters to an end. And I'm so, and I feel that extra bit of resentment against it because I'm like, the last Bond film could have been for your eyes only, but we made two more, and we're robbed of what should have been a farewell to one of the better. Like I feel like more than Connery, Roger Moore is definitely the Bond actor that I um, like. I enjoy. Like there were yeah. times. Yeah, I definitely. I find he's he's a lot more charismatic. He's 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 kind of more self aware than Connery. Like right. he's a lot more mm. like he's a little bit more prone to like winking, and I appreciate that about him. It's something that Pierce Brosnan would carry the torch of later. But he's very suave. He's very elegant, and except when they decided not to. Like I also I also don't like Man with a Golden Gun at all. So I'll, I'll join in the chorus on that one. Um, mm. But no, just just ugh. so no. Favorite and second favorite Bond film, period, um, one of the best spy films, I think, ever, is, um, for your eyes only, uh, honorable mention to Moonraker, but then the two worst are Octopussy and A View to a Kill. Right. Uh, Tracy, just to, just to close up that part, uh, quickly, uh, best and worst, Roger Moore. Right. Um, so I think we all can, we all agree the spy who loved me, so I'm not even going to go there. That's fine. The spy who loved me is um, the best Roger. Though I will say because, maybe because of, of the the music, the song and that kind of stuff, I do have a very soft spot for Moonraker and uh, <laughs> wow. Bond typing in Typing in the ET, the ET music theme into the um, the security. Oh, 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 that was no, uh, uh, not ET. Uh, close encounter. Close, close encounter. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Close encounter. Yeah. So, 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 the spy who loved me is the best, and I will give special mention to Moonraker. For me, the worst. Um, no, see, here's the thing. Uh, there are some franchises where I can say the absolute worst. Um, but when it comes to Bond, and, and I was going to say this much earlier on, Bond does this thing for me where it's um, one good film, one one bad film. one Well, not, not bad, but one good film, one not so good film, one good film, one not so good film. So even like when we get to our boy next week or when, when we start to talk about him, there's one good film, one meh, one good film, one meh. So for me, your eye, for your eyes only, is the meh. Like I... I did not like the opening sequence. (laughs) I I did not care for the opening sequence. I did not care for Blofeld falling down uh, 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 a a chimney. Really? Oh, look, Q shot of cat. It's Blofeld. Okay, so Blofeld is back. No, Blofeld isn't back. So you've just, okay, you've ended him. I I accept the, the, the introduction of saying, okay, Mary Bond is gone. And, you know, this is what's happening. I, I, 
saw him there with Agent Bibi Dal. And I was like, okay, so it's Baby Doll, but it's Bibi Dal. And and this, there, are, there are certain things that I expect coming out of a, a Bond film. And I looked at, at For Your Eyes Only, and I didn't feel it. I didn't, I, I, the, the opening, like I said, the opening sequence felt like if it was just like a, a sharp cut into something else. And as much as I love Sheena Easton, as much as I think she's groovy, even the theme song for me wasn't doing it for me. So I, th- those are my polar things. I love The Spy Who Loved Me. Honorable mention, Moonraker. Um, for Your Eyes Only does not work for me in terms of a Roger Moore film. Um, and yeah, that's it. All right. Um, and just quick mention to, of course, um, nearly Timothy Dalton films, The Living Daylights and Lights is the Kill. Um, you know, as I said earlier, you know what I mean? There's, there's two films which I feel work as a double feature. It's these two. I think that they, right at the hands down, they make for like the definitive um, Bond double feature. Because um, they work so well, you know what I mean? In terms of just updating the formula, even Timothy Dalton himself was like, look, I want to go back to basics because Roger Moore's films, for better or for worse, kind of became parody, right? So let's go back to what made these things work, right? Um, and Living Daylights was just a, a, a great film, you know what I mean? And, and it just had some solid action scenes, though. And, you know, it, um, and, you know, it had a great, a fantastic follow-up, though, with, uh, with the um, Likes is a Kill, which is, you know, the first PG-13 uh, Bond film, right? You don't look at it, now you could see how bold and audacious it was in terms of this, and then people know, yeah, we, we go in deep and dark with this. Um, and I honestly forgot that Michael Kamen actually, like, did the score for this, and it just fits that whole Lethal Weapon vibe, you know, because, of course, he did the music for that, right? Where it's like, okay, it's action and sensationalism, but in this world, people can die, and there's consequences, and you all need to be careful, and bad guys are really bad, you know what I mean? Which is like, you know, a, a trope of, you know, like Lethal Weapon and stuff like that, and just action films of, you know, the late 80s now. So I felt like this film more um, out of, you know, just that's like, you know, other, like, I would say like Daniel Craig films in particular. This one actually understood the era, it understood the time, it understood like, okay, this is the type of film that goes now, let's just take a risk. Even right down to having the villain be a drug kingpin and not just some guy with dreams to take over the world. I love how subtly it uses, you know, bits of elements like, say, Thunderball and stuff like that, where, okay, we're going to use the stuff that the evil bad guys have, but we're just going to do it different in terms of, like, um, laundering money and drugs like that, right? So it works. Um, And Timothy Dalton, though, I felt like he just owned that role, though. He was just... He was just like rootless in this one. You really felt it though. But I like that, you know, it, it does kind of remind you, hey, it's a Bond film, you know. So even though you have your dark, serious moments, we still have your fun, over-the-top stuff too, but not too over-the-top as well, right? But yeah, for me, I think Timothy Dalton is easily one, easily the most underrated Bond. I would say him and, you know, um, Lazabi to extend though. But for me, what he did here with those two films were just excellent though. And last thing I'll say though, he deserved a third film. He deserved one. Uh, he didn't even get that because, you know, um, it took three films for, for, for audiences to really appreciate Sean Connery as James Bond. And Timothy Dalton only had two because, oh, you know what I mean? It was too dark and violent and six and seven year olds. Can't, I can't take my six and seven year olds to see that. But like Sekiro wasn't made for six and seven year olds. Like, just seeing. So, yeah, honestly, he deserved a third film. I would have, like, I just pictured in my mind it would come out, like, in 91, 92, you know what I mean, when, you know, action movies were really hit to the peak, you know what I mean, like, two to two and stuff like that. And, you know, if it didn't work then, then fine, bring in um, PS afterwards. But, nah, they, 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 they did Timothy Dirty, man. Um, I don't know if you guys agree or disagree. I'm I'm cool with it. Like, the only, <clears throat> the one that I'm legitimately cool with is License to, License to Kill. I still remember him diving into the boat, um, coming from the sky and diving into the boat and he lands inside the boat. And the, I think it's like the opening sequence and the idea of seeing what a, what passed for a mobile phone um, back <laughs> there while he's picking it. And it's like, oh my God. And the idea of even his friend, because, um, what is this? What's his name? What's his name? What's his name? Felix. Um, Felix. Like, yeah, Felix, Felix the idea of Felix, because it's only now that it, it, it dawns on me how very um, lethal weapon it is in terms of villains doing the mostest. I mean, you'll have Felix's wife is 
like, you know, killed and Felix was almost left for dead and all sorts of randomness is happening down in Miami because um, that's where drugs were, you know. Um, I think it's Miami. But it's 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 the idea of that that I like. I really didn't care for The Living Daylights. I do not remember it that much. I have a greater memory of License to Kill and I do dig Timothy Dalton older. Like when he's, you know, the head of Gallifrey, um, that's my Timothy Dalton. You know what I mean? Like that, that's when I, I start loving him a little bit more. He gets better with age, kind of like Pierce, but mm. License to Kill was, was groovy for what it was. Right. Um, um, I would say, I, yeah, go then, on, go on. Kano, yeah, no, I know uh, this is your favorite, um, oh, yeah, no. like ever, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, any, again, anyone who follows me on social media is fully, very much aware, especially after my journey with James Bond, that License to Kill is my favorite Bond film of all time, and it is one of the best spy movies ever made, in my opinion. And I feel like the thing that, because like from, and for me, that ranking goes License to Kill for your eyes only, and then followed by Living Daylights, and then other spy movies. But like, the thing for me that really, because Dalton m makes Bond a character. Like he's not a walking, he's not walking one-liners, and he's not like just like a self-insert for 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 uh, the audience. Like Bond is an actual character, and I love how he's like Dalton gives him this like this 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 very intense violent streak, and he deliberately contrasts the like suave in the casino playing cards, whatever, with the like ruthless violence and you feel like it's this you know there's this kind of duality that goes there and like none of the other actors before had acknowledged the duality of bond like the kind of guy who can like be absolutely ruthless but then can also like suavely walk into a casino i think it wasn't until craig that that duality was acknowledged ever again and dalton does the best with that and license to kill shows that off the best because it makes it personal like i've been sitting here at this point watching all the bond films through and i get to license to kill and it's like a shot of adrenaline straight to the arm i mean living daylights was a little bit of that and i really like living daylights because it's it's a lot of fun dalton is fresh and new and the action is big and exciting some of it it, it drags in places and it's not the most memorable but it's overall pretty great but license to kill is this shot of adrenaline in the arm and and like the movie's best strength is actually making it personal. Like this isn't a mission Bond is assigned. Yes. This is like, yes. This is a personal thing that he has to go. Like this is the only the only times I've ever seen Bond like get involved in something because like there was like a, a personal element to it. Like this is this isn't a mission he's coldly assigned to. And he even goes rogue from the agency to to pursue his goal, which is huge for me. Like I'm sitting yes. here watching. Yes. Be because of the whole British nationalism thing about these films, like Bond is always first and foremost, just queen and country. Yes, I, I'm going to put my feelings aside. I'm aware of Her Majesty's government. But then like, no, License to Kill, he's he's out to avenge his friend. He's out to get this bad guy. And then even when the other agents catch up and are like, Bond, your License to Kill is revoked, you know, he, he does what he does best and gets away. And then throughout the whole film, even his relationship with the love interest is complicated because like, she has to contend with the duality of Bond. She has to do deal with like the suave romantic man one minute, and then like if he thinks he's holding out information, suddenly he gets violent, and it feels like it's right. ruthless. And, he, and there's that scene where he catches himself, where he's about to like interrogate her for info, and I'm like, Bond has never been this dramatic. Like Bond has never explored this kind of like Bond catching himself about to go too hard on someone. This is the yeah. kind of. This is the kind of narrative meat and potatoes I have been waiting for these this, right. these films to dive into, and they haven't. So, and like so, license like literally, license to kill in just about every conceivable way takes everything I like about Bond. I mean, except for like some of the high camp, but then again, it would have been out of place here, so I don't miss it too much. But it's it takes everything I love about Bond. I feel like. You could almost watch for your eyes only Living Daylights and License to Kill is like this trilogy where you almost see this like older spy hand over this this title to this younger spy who's got his own issues. At least in my head canon, that's how it flows. But like they work. No, I just, just License to Kill works on just about every level I could want and some ways in which I wasn't expecting. Like of all my ex my kind of deadened and numbed expectations for a Bond film, it's actually it actually came in like shook me by the shoulders and like actually 
like captured my mind and it's it's the one that like if i ever think about rewatching it that's the one that like comes back to me it's the most fun action scenes the pg it earns that pg-13 so hard like there are yes, so many there are so many action scenes in that movie that go hard as only like mid to late 80s pg-13 can and i'm sitting here like oh, oh god like is, is bond gonna actually make it through this like i know there's other ones but this is the last dalton ah like it's just about and like it makes you feel like this world of espionage is actually dangerous and there's actually risks and the villain is you like you you want this guy dead so like on the one hand yeah, you Ro- want... robert dv or yeah robert oh DV. yeah yeah he's he's, guy. he's he's a guy you love to hate the oh, show. You, love to hate, you love to hate this guy and like I, lo- I love i love he's played a couple like hero roles too i like him in like maniac cop too but in this he plays such a delightful villain and benicio del toro is his savage henchman <laughs> oh, yes. right yeah right yeah, yeah works yeah. so no license to kill by like a county mile is my favorite of the Bond franchise. And for me, works on just about every conceivable level. And I am so... I was so... We'll get into Brosnan, but for me, I was disappointed that, like, we weren't... We didn't we didn't carry on this trend of, like, making the Bond films more dramatic and more character-driven and more personal. And we kind of went backwards a little bit with 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 brosnan but right. yeah for me license to kill bond hasn't really even some of craig i would argue except for one of the craig films hasn't really come close to the bar that's been set by license to kill for me but yeah those are my my humble uh thoughts yeah not, nothing too out there just like my my, my thoughts on this all right and last but not least uh ps brosnan right so um i'll keep it short and sweet uh my favorite obvious is ghoul and i right um sure. runner up is of course tomorrow never dies right i really dug um you know i just love that concept of you know this guy who's basically seeing tomorrow's news today and you know, he's just manipulating yeah. all these things just to sell people's right i mean it's it's bigger than that but that's how it sells right um michelle Yeo in that film was fantastic it got some great action scenes from it i love how she kind of stood her ground with bonds it's like oh you're trying to hit on me all right look wait until the job is done and then, then maybe you might have a chance, right? Which happens, right? But yeah, Golden Eye literally was just like the the, the franchise just kickstarting uh, for the nineties. Though it embraced the mid nineties uh, summer blockbuster isms, basically. But or well, I guess it came out in summer, I assume, right? Or whatever, right? Um, yeah, and I mean, it was. I mean, for one thing, um, it was just a new bond. It was just bigger, louder. Um, they took risk as well to even write, you know, um, case in point, um, you know, um, on the top, you know, we, <laughs> one of the most memorable uh, Bond, Bond Gilles, right, for better films, yeah, right? Yeah, Jean Grey one, yeah. Yeah, Jean Grey. With, you know? with, <laughs> yeah, with, with her ties, with her ties, right? Which I remember for the time I was like, oh my god, are we doing this? You know what I mean? But yeah, they did it, right? Uh, we, we, we got a great video game out of it for one thing, one of the greatest video games of all time, hands yeah. down. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, well it's greatest, well, what greatest, greatest, what are the greatest console shooters of all time? <laughs> like, yes, 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 okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You're right, you're right. Not, not the greatest, mind you. Shooter, Sorry. Okay. Shooters on console. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, and, uh, and for me personally, I, you know, like, I will admit it's not the best Bond film ever. Like, I'm not seeing that, right? But in terms of, okay, it's a new decade. Let's see how we could update this thing while giving you the goods. Let's let's make you all believe in this in this hero again. Um, let's make him relevant somewhat in, in this decade. I, I thought that it worked here, right? Um, as far as it was... Or well, I should say least favorite, uh, because you know I could kind of watch it. You know what I mean? If I feel like to, if if I feel like it, or maybe if I just have like two, three drinks in me, uh, die another day. Um, yeah, this this was what really almost I should say killed the the, the Bond franchise, and this was where the you know it was of update in the formula they just did any worse ways because yeah we have to do post matrix early 2000s action cinema so everything uh, has to be big and grandiose and loud and all that kind of stuff it's even right down to the point when you watch it again and it's so detailed it's laughable dread they do the whole sped up and the, the whole speed up the image um uh, sorry the the um the video and then slow it down to make it all stylized and shit and it like it have moments where it happens and i just like rule my eyes like Ugh. like like you already taught this would do you already thought this this was a cool thing um and I mean, like, 
the concept, like it starts off pretty well, eh? don't get me wrong. Eh? Um, but I would say from the moment they hit Iceland, boy, that's when everything just went downhill. <laughs> boy, it was the ice mansion or whatever it is that the villain was in. It was the reveal of who the villain was. Okay. It was him kite surfing over a tsunami with yeah. this <laughs> giant laser that, yeah. you know, it was, it was like... I understand. I understand the era bigger is supposed to be better, but oh gosh, man, don't don't do don't do James Bond that especially don't do PS Brosnan that man, you know what I mean? So yeah, wait, this this was what really like killed the franchise for me though. And then of course we got, you know, the the worst um Bond team out of it, right? And then of course they had the nerve to 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 to, to shoehorn Madonna in it because I mean it's Madonna. Of course she needed to be in this movie, right? It's like she's a central sure. character, like what she was in, in friggin' Dick Tracy back in nineteen ninety, right? But hey, it is what it is, right? Uh Tracy, best and worst PS person. Right. Okay, so Let's start with the worst. Um, because we all have feelings, like legit feelings for, or about, I should say, die another day, I'm going to revert to my second not favorite um, Pierce, which is the world is not enough. Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. Someone actually picks it. Nice. This, 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 was my, this was my dishonorable mention, you know? The thing, with, the, the thing with the world is not enough is that there are two things that, that got me really happy um, in terms of going into the film. It is the theme from, what is it, Garbage? The theme from Garbage, where yeah. they do the whole robot bomb exploding people thing. That was great. And there's, you know, okay, so there are things about Oh, by the way, speaking of that, that team, I, I, I always found it the most underwhelming, one of the most underwhelming songs. Underwhelming. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like I should like it, but I just hear it and just like, no, it, it just feels like, like, uh, like, uh, like garbage doing a version of like you know a 70s bond film um bond team in my opinion this it i don't know it, it just kind of lacks something it lacks a bit of um Gusto, not originality guess, a lot of character it's just like we're, we're gonna do like what you know um the the older um songs how they sounded like we're gonna try to do that and i don't know just didn't work for me but yeah go on the, 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 so like I agree with you um, in terms of the theme. The theme is one of those things where if I'm if I'm listening to it or if I queue it up, like if I queue it up now, I will listen to it and like it. Yay, that's nice. Um, and like I said, it did get me a little. It got me it got me excited to see to you know dive into to the world is not enough. But the trailer, because I, what I was about to say is like there are things about Bond films that I actually like. Um, that sticks with you, and there is this. There's this line that 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 stays with me. There's this line that says, um, and these are not the exact words, but it's along the lines of, as we head into, because I'm seeing the clock going down, as we head into the new millennium. You know, there's only one name that you can be sure of, and they do this montage with everybody calling Bond's name. It's the girl. It's it's M. It's 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 Q. Everybody's saying Bond, Bond, and I was like, mm, I, I remember there, there's, that. Yeah. There's a hype. I do not need Dr. Christmas Jones. I don't. I no, think no, Robert, no, nobody asks for Christmas. Nobody yeah, for needs really, Dr. Just Christmas Jones. Is he one of the worst Bond girls in my opinion? I just, I just. Is like, he one of the worst? You know, I, you know, I've heard all, all, the, all the Christmas jokes. So spare me. I was like, all right. Um, I, I, I have a. I like Robert Carlyle, and I like Robert Carlyle a lot more in the Once Upon a Time days. To be honest, as Rumble Silskin. And I like the idea of a, of the villain who is, you know, he has the, the the bullet lodged in his brain and we can't operate on it. So because of that, he's, you know, he yep. doesn't feel pain. But I just, yep. I, it just didn't gel for me the way how I wanted it to. And this is a movie, like, it has all this stuff. It has the gadgets. It has the, the over-the-top villain. It has the very gorgeous bond girl bond girls because i mean even the the one of the girls he, he was with turns out to be the villainess of this story which and, i hate you know and i just electra her name is electra and um i still didn't care for it so there's that um in terms of my favorite now i i i i do still especially like if I'm in a line, might find my brain saying things like, wait your turn, um, in that weird Russian-esque accent that Famke Johnson was doing for Golden Eye. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I thought you were going to see the, 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 um, the other actress who was in it. 
Oh, uh, no, God. Especially, uh, especially uh, like, what did you see? Uh, you're, you're, you're like, boys with toys. <laughs> I'll go up, um, the, the, the actual scientist. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I, I, Isabella Skorupko. That's her real name. Yeah. There you go. So I like I like Goldeneye and I like the the certain things about Goldeneye, but the one that I really and truly fall for is Tomorrow Never Dies, because nice. it's for me even today the idea of a media mogul who wants to create the news and therefore he is aligned with people who are who are evil, um, who is uh, as evil as he is, in order to create a world where he yeah. can be on top. It feels strangely 2021. It yes. feels like uh, this is a real yes. thing. I thought it was a very prescient movie. It, it, yes. I just, very prescient movie. And, 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 and the opening, now, you all know how I feel about the actual song. So the opening, the opening sequence where everybody's sitting down there and they think that Bond is dead and, or, you know, what, black, black, Black Knight to White Knight, what's going on? And they can't find him because he's dead. And he's just there with this one rifle. I mean, I know, I know, but he's just there with this one rifle and just shooting everybody down and blowing the entire arms bazaar to smithereens. And then boom, jumps out, gets on on a on a on a on a on a plane, on a on a one of those crafts, dodges the torpedo and lives. Q Cheryl Crow tomorrow never dies. I, you know, and that was the age when, you know, um, Terry Hatcher was doing Lois and Clark. And I mean, I was. Oh, for real. I was into. <laughs> well, that yeah, was my you Friday. Forget that she's in the show. Wow. Yeah, she was, yes. wow. Oh, yeah, she was great at this. Yeah, she, I agree, I agree. She, she was, she was joy. So, and that was my Friday nights on TV6 because it was um, uh, Lois and Clark. And then I think Buffy or Buffy and Lois and Clark, one out of the two. But the point <laughs> is. Raven. They were. <laughs> it was, it was a thing. So that. Tomorrow Never Dies is my peak, um, is my peak Pierce, um, and I, 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 I legitimately will, you know, I could watch that like right now and still be very happy about it. The world is not enough, and clearly, um, Die Another Day because everything in Die Another Day, Die Another Day, and I'll say this really quick is is feels like okay because this is. And I feel, and I feel it might have been the 40th anniversary or something, because they tried to do way too many throwbacks. So here is Ursula Andres coming out of the water with the dagger at her side. Here's Halle Berry coming out of the water with the dagger at her side. Here is the same laser that is, you know, coming at 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 James in, in uh, the, um, Goldfinger. Goldfinger. And even and Captain even Picard. Halle Berry's character makes that reference too in her dialogue. Yeah. I'm like, what? Jinx yeah. is Jinx as a character. I I. I I I don't feel Jinx. I get Jinx, but I don't. But that's Halle Berry's character. I get Jinx. I just don't feel Jinx. So Die Another Day has had its moments, and then of course Madonna as a fencing instructor who's talking about keeping their tip up, and uh, you know, yeah. the, 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 yeah. no. <laughs> so, but everybody in this room feels that way about Die Another Day. So the second worst for me is in terms of Pierce, is the world is not enough. And that's it. For right. Me. Okay. Uh, Alice, uh, best and worst Pierce. Uh, my favorite um, Pierce is actually Tomorrow Never Dies. Um, aye, aye. Yeah. For the same, a lot of the same reasons that you guys mentioned. Um, as a villain, somebody who uses their media platform to manipulate the news and manipulate the outcome of the future. I mean, a lot of people do that right now, right? Use social media platforms to cause fights and possibly world wars and, and contention and strife, right? So it's like a foreshadowing of the future. Um, bon, bon Girl, one of my favorites, Michelle Yeoh. And yep. yeah, it was a refreshing take. She didn't just sleep with, with Brosnan the first time she met him, fall head over heels. Um, she was like her, almost his equal in terms of Bond Girls. She was, she was clearly like, more competent than him. Yes. That's like, true, yeah. true. yes, that's true. In a lot of cases, she was more competent than he was. Um, Terry Hatcher, one of my favorite actress actresses as well too. Um, a little tidbit for you guys: uh, she was actually pregnant while she was filming Tomorrow Never Dies. Oh, she was getting that. sick often on the set, and Brosnan kind of lost his temper and patience a few times with her because of that, because she was suffering with modern sickness a lot. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, oh, that yeah. sucks. 
Yeah, yeah. So he was a bit mean is one of the reasons why I don't really run at Brosnan too much because he kind of doesn't have patience. That, that's not the only actress that kind of complained about him not having patience for them on set, by the way. Yeah, um, I, I wonder if it was because of how he how he had the, ch- the, the chance to be to replace um, Roger Moore, but, you know, contract is used now. So maybe he's just like, yeah. you know, I wait, oh, wait so long to be born, so... Yeah, because he was contracted to Robinson Steel, exactly. Yeah, to Robinson Steel. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, special what, what about... Oh, sorry. To Golan Eye, though. Special mention to Golan Eye, because it's my second favorite. Right. Um, uh, what about... What about... What's your... What's your worst? Worst is that another day, hands down. Yep. Um, yep, yep, yep. It was over the top, ridiculous scripting. Like you said, that scene where he was riding the tsunami, <sighs> totally ridiculous. Um, also has one of my least favorite Bond girls, Halle Berry. I love Halle Berry as an actress, but as Jinx, like Tracy mentioned, terrible. The character was so less empty, carbon, copy-paste, whatever it is. Yes, they tried to mimic the scene of Ursula Andress in Dr. No, and that failed miserably. So, yeah, they tried to copy so many things, including... uh, Diamonds are forever with the big satellite created with the reflection of the yeah. diamonds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Only thing I found what was kind of cool was the look of. Now forgive me, I don't remember his name, but the the Korean actor, when the um. When the, oh, the, the kind of um, diamond the diamonds. Yeah, it yes. was on his on his, on his uh, cheek. That, like yes. look at it. Like I watched it. I actually watched over the end of the day. Yes, I know, right? Um, yes. I actually thought that that was a really like smart, um, you know, designer. Actually, oh, sorry, yeah. uh, piece of uh, makeup actually. Yes, yes, I agree with you totally. I, 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 I love that part, that look of it. Um, in terms of villain, I thought that the villain was very underwhelming to me because from the beginning he just seemed like a little spoiled child stomping his feet at his father, who was free in general. Yeah. Didn't you like, get that I, impression? I, I, I told, yeah, that's yeah. what that's what that's what I agree. With. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's just like a little spoiled child, like no, oh, and my father never listens to me. Blah blah blah. <laughs> it's like okay, wine, wine, wine. You finish whining, and then you you the first chance you get, you go and you turn your face into the same people that you despise, the white people. Yeah, for for reasons, eh? For reasons. for reasons, for reasons. Okay, <laughs> turn yourself into a Latino or something else, or another Asian-looking something. But really, yeah. I know you have to spend the rest of your life looking like a white man. The same people that you despise, right? It's just I don't know. That nothing we thought about that movie. Not even um, the the MI6 agents that were that turned out to be the villain working for 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 him. For or Rosamund Pike, I. He to that decision, like my yes. god. And then what? Why watch over? I realized, wait, he the bad guy bought her over, you know. Kind of mm-hmm. like, okay, how she could switch sides? No, it's because he 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 bought her over. He, yes. he like flat out says he bought her out. They yeah, were what? they were they were in 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 university or something together, and she was supposed to be the second. Why do I know all these things? She was supposed to be the second. <laughs> <person>. <laughs> Like the champ, defending champion, but James right. yeah. Stephen, and yeah. he yeah. Yeah, yeah. was the one who actually kind of like I don't know if he killed the other person or something. Basically, he's he one that, that, that helped her get her. So yeah, you know, done, he was done bad for oh her. You yeah. know, right? My my whole thing with Gustav as a random thing is that there is there is a, a modern day Gustav now, and he is trying to live in space. So whenever <laughs> you know, I think of that, I just like yeah, okay. Burns. <laughs> yes. Oh no, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, um, in terms of, well, just one yeah. other little special mention, uh, as you guys were talking about it just now, um, Matt, um, the film that you all were hated on, the world is not enough. Um, I kind of sort of like it because um, here's the thing: I do agree with you that Denise Richards is. Terrible, terrible, terrible casting and everything. And she has the personality of a wet blanket, right? And and the ending scene where they were showing you the infrared of the two of them, yes, totally ridiculous. Ugh. But um, I loved, like Tracy was saying, the, the, the aspect of the villain with the bullet in his head and he can't feel any sort of pain or anything like that. But yeah. I kind of loved 
love the twist uh, that you didn't see coming. I, I remember the first time seeing that movie, and I didn't see that twist coming that Electra Sophia Marcel was the actual villain who was actually ruling the the villain who the, who was accused of kidnapping her. I kind of enjoyed that twist, and I could understand why she ended up kind of psychotic in the head, for okay. want of a better word, you know. So uh, that aspect the, of, of the plot, I, I kind of enjoy. So it's kind of on my guilty pleasures list. But I do agree with the points that you all made about Denise Richards and, and so on. But I think at that time, it really looked like Brosnan was kind of losing his team because he really didn't look like he was in, into, into that one, into the movie. Like maybe he was getting a bit tired of the franchise at that point, I believe. So, right, yeah, that's, that's just and, my opinion. Yeah. And, and who could blame him at this point, right? Exactly. Uh, so, two more to go. Uh, Ricardo, best and worst fierce person. Uh, yeah, um, best fierce, in my opinion, is Tomorrow Never Dies. I actually really like this movie. Again, all right, all right. you know, it doing, it doing the whole Rupert Murdoch thing. And, yeah, I thought they just, they just need that premise. And as, um, what's his name? What was the actor, boy? The Pope himself. Um, gosh, what's his oh, name? Just, oh, Jonathan Price. Jonathan Price, yeah, I thought he was yeah. great as the villain because he's like it's like a mix between Rupert Murdoch, but a little bit of Steve Jobs kind of going on. Yeah, I like that. I like the weird nerdy nerd villains that are trying to be intimidated. He's he's a he's a kind of a goofball, you know. He, if you try to punch body, he'll break his hand, right? I like villains like that. <laughs> uh, um, then yeah, uh, yeah, movie great action. Michelle Yao kicks so much ass in this. I love it. Um, oh, Terry Hatcher was great in this. Um, yeah, just I think and the, the core the core thing that sold it was the premise, like. I just, just like wait, that is it, that is the idea. That's such a really clever idea because it it on the one end feels seemingly quite plausible even back then, um, and definitely now. And then, but it also felt over the top and ridiculous, like a Bond plot. So that's why I really appreciated it in in that way. Um, right, and I forgot to mention we keep forgetting it um, in terms of tomorrow never dies, Moby's version of the James Bond team. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, he was right. I fuck with yeah. that. I sorry, yeah. I just fucks with that. Right. But yeah, um, what, what's your words? Right, worse is, is as, as call it, as make the joke, me and my friends used to make the joke, fed up out the will, right? The will is not enough. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. Yeah, the will is not enough. Here's the thing. All the shit you could give GoldenEye, GoldenEye just had a, a, a kind of goofy charm to it that I could, re- I remember it. I barely remember what is not enough. It just, when I, it's only when you guys had to mention it, it's like, oh yeah, that bullshit wasn't it. And that forgettable nonsense wasn't it. And look, I, I, I love just remember. I just remember there was there was stuff that took place in the opening sequence and that. Right, that, that's it. 20 yeah, minutes, the, that, that's opening, all. The opening sequence is pretty cool with that black boat thing. That little baby black boat he was driving around mm-hmm. in. It's like, oh, that's that kind of pretty cool. Um, I like Robert Carlyle, you know, you know, my favorite character is his character in, in Star Trek Universe, you know. I, I like the actor. I love the dude. But it just, just didn't fit or work for me. It it was just bland and forgettable. It, mm-hmm. it had a look, decent enough script, but just too much dumbness for it, to, for it to not be enjoyable. And then taking itself too seriously so, so i can't remember it uh, it's just in, the, in that 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 uncanny valley of of bad bond of just too serious and then too silly at the same time it, it, it very little of it work and i just barely remember it um yeah so well there's nothing enough is my 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 least all right and last but not least cc just to close things off best right. and worst pierce so like best for me is actually i mean again needing to rewatch golden eye but putting it to the side, but like, I'm kind of tied between world is not enough and tomorrow never dies because like they they really do balance out for me as far as like, like there's a lot of things I like about one that I also like about the other. There's some that some that one does better, but other things the other does better. Like I do Michelle Yao is a, is a point all to herself and like how much I like um, the world. Is it? Well, tomorrow, not... tomorrow never dies. Yeah. Yeah. You know, right. Tomorrow never dies because like she finally delivers on the because like up, even as early as Connery, um, the films have been teasing or like trying to develop the idea of like a female agent who can keep up with Bond, right. and like they tease the idea and and even like my big frustration with from Russia with love not from Russia with love um the spy who loved me is mm. that we have this is that we tease like a female agent who's like the equivalent and has got like a personal connections with Bond. And yet we still find the time to make like woman driver jokes, whatever. But finally, with Tomorrow Never Dies, we finally have a female agent who is Bond's equal and can keep up with him. And Michelle Yao 
uh, Michelle, yeah, I don't, I could watch anything Michelle, Michelle, Michelle Yao has been in. Like, yeah. she's, she's just absolutely amazing. She carries the movie Agreed. almost like single handedly, and she is absolutely fantastic. Um, and as like, and not, not a Bond girl, but like another agent. It's like yeah, exactly. such a delightful upgrade, and it, it makes the movie really great for me. I mean, and it's, so it's no surprise that the worst for me is Die Another Day. And I feel like, (laughs) rather than just say, yet again, I didn't like tomorrow. I, for me specifically, right? Because I, there was this weird period in like the mid to late 90s and early 2000s when we were really getting into like retro pulp. Like it's very odd. Yeah. But you had things like The Shadow and The Phantom and Rocketeer, which I all love. And a couple, I I think Indiana Jones had a lot to do with this, but there was this whole like let's take genre fiction and pulp and pulpy filmmaking back to the like its inception. Like let's let's make period films. Let's go back to like the earlier pulpier stuff. But for some reason, when Bond does it, I think it's because it's too married to the access of not just '90s action, but like early 2000s action. It's like like you're saying, Matthew. Like it it. First and foremost, it's a loud, bombastic, noisy, like visually and like narratively noisy 2000s action film in all of the worst ways. Like there's a couple of films in the era that I think have actually aged a little better. But unfortunately, Die Another Day is not one of them. And Die Another Day is just like a 2000s action film in all the worst possible ways. And as an attempt to do retro pulp unlike a ma- unlike like a masterpiece like the shadow it never manages to like actually feel genuine it always feels like pastiche like it never has this right. like organic camp pulp quality like it never organically like when i think back to dr no and i think about dr no's laboratory and i think about like how it feels straight out of some kind of retro futuristic um comic book or something from the from the 60s like it feels very natural it feels very organic it like it makes sense and the film always manages to feel like pastiche rather than actually feeling like genuine pulp i don't i don't know if it's because it winks too much or if it hams it up too much or if it's so over the top like it, it's moonraker or um you only live twice levels of over the top, but it always feels more like it's mimicking those films rather than actually bringing anything of its own to the proceedings. And then like, by, and by the time the, the bad guy is hanging out in the, in a power suit, you're just sitting there going, how, how did we, how did this become a bad Robert Rodriguez movie? Like how did, how, how did, <laughs> This isn't James Bond. This is Spy Kids 5. How did we get here? I know, right? And, and it looks shockingly cheap. That's the other thing about the film that's alarming to me. Like, for a James Bond summer blockbuster from a major studio, it feels very cheap. I don't know if it's the combination. You, you, you could see the green screen moments. You could just tell. Yeah. Like, even in the opening sequence where you see Bond fighting one of the main villains on top of this um, tank or whatever it is, you could tell yeah. where, because there's these medium close-ups now, you could tell it's 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 green screen. But the wide shots, however, those are real. You, you could just tell when you when you watch that scene. Tell some, and then like, even the, even the actual practical sets, like at no point when I'm looking at the ice palace, am I like, oh, look, an ice palace. I'm always like, man, this ice set looks quite plastic, doesn't it? And, it's, and then they're driving sports cars. And just, it just becomes this parade of nonsense. And it's never, in itself, it never actually finds its own stride. It always feels like a movie that's caught between two very different eras of filmmaking and throwing as much at the screen as it can to see what works. And it never manages to actually hit its own stride and feel comfortable in its own skin, ultimately. So, no, Die Another Day is bad. But Die Another Day is one of those films that's bad in ways that you you, you could get, like, a round table together and have everyone sit around and talk about all the different ways which Die Another Day is bad. Although, also, trivia, I was doing – I was looking up the director of Die Another Day – and it turns out that one of his follow-up projects was Triple X Two: State of the Union. <laughs> well, that makes sense. I yep. mean, if you if you remember, if you remember, if you remember, if you remember <laughs> the, the final action sequence of that, then 
I mean, oh, oh, I mean, yeah. oh. <laughs> Jeez. It, it just always cracks me up. I always go back to this. It always cracks me up that Michael Wilson um, thought, you know, he was saying that this is the way that we will move forward. And in a real sense, I'm sitting on here and I'm now wondering if maybe like Phantom Menace and stuff had stuff to do with it because you have, it was a world of green screen back then yes. and everybody was doing stuff. And maybe they thought, well, we can do this too. And this is how we're going to revolutionize Bond. And it was just so sad and just like the the water didn't look real the nothing yeah. felt like it could be real. and you think this is going to revolutionize bond moving forward so i'm so glad that they ditched that idea and went to like daniel or you know that level instead well, I feel like yeah. the level, which i'm always like it, it's what i was saying about bond always being like one step behind the cultural zeitgeist because like back in the 70s that's how we got moonraker right like we're moving towards sci-fi and fantasy blockbusters and so bond tries to get a piece of that and so we end up with a a bond movie that starts out normal and then by the end we're having a laser battle in space and wondering how we got there and the same thing is true with die another day like i could completely see a future where if it, if we didn't go into daniel craig i could completely see a future where because, because again that was the cultural zeitgeist thanks to phantom menace thanks to and then later i mean much later obviously but james cameron's avatar it's this cultural zeitgeist of blockbusters are like big and lots of special effects and out there and over the top and dig and very digital and cgi heavy so like we have like so of course i could completely see a future where like i don't know james bond is showing up to like a moon colony and trying to like bust a, a bad guy who wants to move us all to Mars or so like, or, or <laughs> James Bond at the center of the earth or James Bond at the bottom of the sea. Like I could absolutely. Th those would make for some good titles. Uh, <laughs> like, like for real, for real. James Bond at the center. All right. Uh, oh, but let's like, have that as a TV series. <laughs> you know? <laughs> But no, I could, I absolutely, like, when when you say that the producer was like, we're going to go in this direction, I can completely see that. Because it's, it, and that's what it feels like with Die Another Day. Like, Die Another Day is the first Bond film, well, not the first, but, like, it, it's a Bond film that feels like it's trying to play catch up to where the culture is, rather than trying to have an identity as a James Bond film, really. And it's, I'm very glad that the reaction to it. I feel like a, a big reason, and this again leads into next week's discussion about Craig, but I do feel like a big reason we shifted is because the, gold, the cultural, well, is a combination of the reaction to Die Another Day being as bad as it was. But then the cultural... 9-11. 9-11. Like, yeah, 9-11 was, was a huge, back. huge factor to the, yeah. to the change of and the, the character. Oh, and, the, and the way 9-11 shifted blockbuster filmmaking, period. Exactly. Like, like, we... And especially espionage. Like, the spy genre had been getting more and more over the top, more and more colorful, more and more, like, wild and ridiculous. Again, we started with, like, Alfred Hitchcock's Notorious, and by the time we get to the 90s and 2000s, we're making spy kids. So the genre has shifted, and then 9-11 happens, and the whole idea of espionage and spies becomes, like, way less, like, like, it's way less, it's, it's, it's way less sexy and more dangerous. It's less over the top and campy and more gritty and morally gray. And then, of course, Jason, the, the Jason Bourne films. And then Mission, Mission Impossible goes in a more stripped down direction as well. And then James, Jason Bourne happens and then Bond has to, like, switch gears from where it had gone. And don't forget the car mechanics who are now spies themselves, eh? because that's a very important thing as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for real. <laughs>